This is the lead story of the day in many ways. UN reform. Donald Trump getting together with the Secretary General Antonio Guterres here in New York City and sitting down and discussing the way forward. Now, Donald Trump said that the UN budget had increased by 140 percent and its staff had doubled since 2000 and that the US felt it wasn't really getting a return on its money. There was praise for the Secretary General for recognizing that reform is necessary and according to President Trump, pursuing a people first, bureaucracy second, policy. Here now is more of what Mr. Trump had to say. I applaud the Secretary General for laying out a vision to reform the United Nations so that it better serves the people we all represent. We support your efforts to look across the entire system and to find ways the United Nations can better and be better at development, management, peace, and security. And China, too, getting in on the act, saying that it believes the U.N. is looking more favorably on its own plans for U.N. reform. Here is the foreign ministry spokesperson. Past resolutions adopted by the U.N. General Assembly and Security Council have also contained such contents as the building of the Belt and Road Initiative and a vision of a community of shared future for mankind that are proposed by China. This demonstrates that the Chinese voices, Chinese proposals, and Chinese wisdom are gaining understanding, support, and responses from the increasing number of countries. China, of course, putting forward those reforms as part of its membership of the BRICS nations. Asie? John, let me ask you a question about the Climate Paris Agreement. So much talk about whether the U.S. will stay or pull out. What is the United States' latest position on this? Well, I think the thing to remember regarding the Paris Accord is that it's going to take the United States four years to pull out anyway. So it won't officially disengage from Paris until 2020. And I do think it's worth making the point that Donald Trump and then Rex Tillerson, the Secretary of State, yesterday, Sunday, here in New York, made the point that they're leaving the door open so that if the U.S. can get a better deal, then they may very well go back into the Paris Accord, maybe a reformed Paris Accord, but a Paris Accord nonetheless. However, when that decision was made by President Trump back in June. There was real shock here at UN headquarters in New York. Take a look. UN's immediate reaction back in early June to the U.S. pulling out of Paris came from the very top. The Secretary General yesterday and today has made clear once more that he underscores the need for all countries to play their part. Outside the UN building that day, people seemed to be going about their business with an air of incredulity that Paris appeared on the verge of falling apart. The Paris Climate Agreement Every country in the world is part of it, except for three, including us now. If you're the president of the United States, you have to think not just domestically, but our affairs with other countries. One island nation that fears for its future is Fiji, an archipelago of 300 islands in the South Pacific. Climate change is not new to them. We have felt it 50 years ago. We have been telling uh, the world about the problems in the Pacific countries. There's a lot of uh, islands that are basically coral islands. They're sinking. A lot of villages are disappearing uh, from the surface of the earth. So we are very aware of the, uh, of the issues to climate change. But President Trump's view is that President Obama was tricked by other nations into spending too many U.S. dollars and giving up too much control over the Paris Accord. In the Marshall Islands, also a Pacific Island nation, the ambassador to the U.N. suggests work will go on, with or without the U.S., to make the Paris Accord work. It's not too late. We have a lot of hope, and we will continue to hope for the future of our children, our grandchildren. Because like my president was saying, they need to not only survive, but they need to thrive. In the small Indian Ocean island nation of Seychelles, fishing and tourism dominate the economy, both now affected by climate change. For small island states, it's sea level rise, rising sea temperatures, which, is, which includes uh, ocean acidification, and then issues like, um, like drought, water security, that sort of, sort of thing. It's all a com and they're all linked. He says pulling out of Paris has opened the door for others to step up to the plate. What the Trump administration's withdrawal from, from the Paris Agreement has done, it's opened the door wide for China, India, allying themselves with Europe and hopefully Canada to step in and take over climate leadership. And that is very important, not just because of climate, 
There are economic reasons, there are trade reasons, there are commercial reasons. The night the US pulled out of Paris, key buildings in New York City were lit up green. Now, months later, at this year's General Assembly, the feeling is that pulling out of Paris will take at least four years, in which time there could be a new administration in Washington, D.C. Or the U.S. may have had a change of heart and be seeking to regain a place at the top table of climate change after all. Climate change is something that will be taken very seriously here at the UN General Assembly, and it comes as the UN publishes a report into food security and nutrition around the world. And that report says that hunger is now going up for the first time in a decade, and it specifically blames two things, conflict and climate change. Asie? All right, John Terrett, thank you so much.